Hi, my name is Matt Knudsen. I'm a graduate student at the University of California, Irvine in the Visual Studies program. Um, and this is an analytical speed run of Playdead's Inside. Um, I'm going to speed run this game and uh, provide an, an analysis of it uh, simultaneously. And uh, my intent for this project, uh, there's, there's a couple reasons why I'm doing this. One is because uh, it's, it's an interesting project to me, like I want to see if I can do this. And the other is uh, out of a conviction that um, game studies and scholarship generally should be uh, more openly accessible and be put into refreshing forms um, that uh, it's things like speedruns that may engage new audiences. Um, so the speedrun for Inside is about 73 minutes, 74, um, and the way I play it. Um, the world record is 68, but I'm not going to come close to that. And uh, that, you know, 75-ish 70, minutes is a, uh, is a good length of time for uh, an essay on the topic. There's a lot to talk about in, on Inside, and I want to get to those things. Um, the scholarship that I'm going to be referencing, I'm going to put links in the description for this video. Um, Ian Bogost's essay on empathy that appears in uh, um, How to Do Things with Video Games. Um, uh, Michelle Foucault's uh, Discipline and Punish. I'll be talking about disciplinarity. I'm also going to be talking about Deleuze's concept of the uh, control society. And uh, an author who builds off both of those things is Alexander Galloway in Gaming, Essays on Algorithmic Culture. I'll also be talking about uh, the control society from uh, Galloway's perspective. And the last uh, piece of scholarship is um, Donna Haraway's uh, the F Cyborg Manifesto. I'll also be referencing that. Uh, I'm going to be talking about game design in Inside, and I'm going to be talking about um, embodiment, representation of gender and, uh, and race in the game. I'm going to be talking about uh, institutions of power, and also uh, the last thing is uh, individual action against institutions and collectivism, um, and the, the power for uh, the, the power of collectivism that is realized towards the end of the game. Without further ado, I'm going to start the speed run here. Again, I'm going to shoot for breaking uh, 74 minutes. So, from a game design perspective, one of the first things that you notice is that you start all the way to the left of the screen. And you really can only go right. You start with this barrier on one hand, one side of the screen. And um, this is a lot like Mega Man X. Uh, it has a very similar game design there that it kind of teaches you what you need to do by forcing you to do the things that are required in the game. Um, so here, in order to pass by that log that we saw back there, um, you have to jump over it. And so the game requires you to do things like jump and in a moment, I'll be uh, using the action button to move an object. Um, and it teaches you to do these things without having to tell you to do these things. Um, after the title screen, you know, play dead's inside, um, there's really no words that appear until you see the end credits. There's nothing written on the screen. There's no verbal dialogue other than like grunts and whatnot. Um, instead, the game teaches you what you have to do, as I said, by forcing you to do these things. The other things, so I'm going to use this action button up here to move the fridge. The other thing that you'll probably notice very early in the game is that our main character has no face. Um, it's just a boy, uh, you know, short hair, t-shirt, uh, and pants. Um, very simple uh, character design. Um, but has no face, and actually none of the characters uh, in this work have uh, faces. Um, very nondescript character, and kind of a blank template for you to assign uh, whatever kind of uh, characteristics you wish. Um, and, uh, you know, I mentioned that I'll be talking about scholarship here, and one uh, scholarly work to talk about uh, already is... Um, 
Ian Bogost's essay on empathy that appears uh, both, he published it in uh, Gamma Sutra, but it also appears in his book, How to Do Things with Video Games. And the example that he talks about in that book is um, Link from The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. Um, there's a section where Link is kind of, is, has his sword taken away from him and is basically defenseless. And Bogos reads that as a very rich from an empathetic per- perspective. And um, similar, similarly here, this character is basically defenseless um, in this game. We don't have any weapons to push back against these masked agents that we've been seeing. Um, we don't have any attacks. We're really just running. And for, for the most part, we're running from. Um, and these enemies um, communicate to you that you need to run from them, part, in part because they have these disturbing appearances of like faceless masks, and in part because they chase you as they do here. So someone appears behind you with a flashlight, your instinct is going to be to run away from them. And the game communicates its expectations of you Again, without having to tell you, like, this is an enemy. You have to run away. Like, you just know. Um, the other the other cue, of course, is that um, you have this kind of disturbing synth music um, that cues when the chase starts. You hear these dogs. Obviously, your instinct is going to be to run away from a barking dog. Um, and so the game communicates all these expectations uh, to you without really having to belabor the point. Um, and, you know, as, as Bogos argues with uh, Link in uh, The Wind Waker, we can't help but empathize with this character. Um, we empathize with Link because he's disempowered, and we empathize with this player character, who's, by the way, not named. So faceless, doesn't speak, isn't named. Um, we just I'll just call it the player character. Um, and you empathize with, with them because... Um, uh, because w- we're going to instinctively empathize with um, those who have no power, those who are chased, those who are um, disempowered, uh, the underdog in this, uh, which you clearly are. Um, your opposition in this game, I will refer to as the state and members of the opposition as agents of the state. So these masked individuals with flashlights and guns, um, they're agents of the state. And it's not explained in the game what they want from you, but they clearly want something from you. They're ch- chasing you. Um, they want to take you. And if they do get their hands on you, um, they'll either kill you or tranquilize you. And uh, you have to use your imagination what they do with you next. Um, you've pr- I haven't said anything about this, but I'm jumping all the time. Um, you see that my main mode of traversal is to uh, jump constantly. Um, that's actually just a little bit faster than running in this game. And when you're uh, speed running uh, a game like this, you do whatever is the fastest thing. Um, and so to get around is kind of ridiculous as, as it looks. You're really just jumping all the time. I didn't expect to hit that rope there. So I jumped off the rope very accidentally. Lost some time there. Not optimal. I'm off the world record pace. Uh, I'll deal with it though. So you've been chased for a long time and you get to these chicks here. And uh, this is the first example of kind of a motif in the game that you have these um, animal buddies that keep you company uh, even when things look gloomy. These cute little chicks, little yellow balls of fluff. Um, Thank goodness for them because I need to suck them into this machine to move that barrel of hay, that, um, not a bale, a bale of hay. I've actually failed that before, so I'm glad, <laughs> glad I had just enough chicks to get through here. And, uh, I should also say, you know, having no, okay, here's, here's something I should point out. You see the, how the camera moves up, the camera moves up so to direct your attention to something down. This would be another example of the game not having to tell you everything and rather just by the movement of the camera can suggest solutions to you, suggest the path forward to you. Um, You'll see later that the camera goes down to show you something up that you have to interact with later. Um, 
this run is an any percent run. It's not a 100% run. So I've been skipping Easter eggs. There are Easter eggs in the game um, that you can uh, look at and, um, and interact with, but I won't be doing any of them here. Um, and any percent just means you do whatever it takes to get to the end of the game the quickest. Um, if you do all the Easter eggs, then you will uh, unlock kind of a secret ending. This, the one I'll show you today is like the bad ending, um, but it's all, it also has its own appeal for sure. This is one of the first like jump scares in the game. This pig that, uh, this pig that jumps out at you and um, has this weird worm in the back, you know, coming out of its rear. It's one of the first instances of this biological experimentation that we'll see the state engaging in a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, things in this game just get a little creepier and a little creepier. Here's the first example of the control helmet. And clearly there's this technology that the state is using to control certain types of people. I mean, those people in the background, I'll refer to them as processed humans. Um, they, when they're not being controlled, they're just completely still. And when you are in, in the control helmet, you're able to uh, make them do whatever it is that you're entering as commands. Um, control is a motif that uh, plays a prominent role in this game. Uh, I mentioned that there are multiple endings of this game. So if you do get all the Easter eggs, mm -hmm. then um, you're able to uh, unlock the special ending where you go uh, down beneath the cornfield that we that we saw earlier, and you undo this machine that is like the central control unit. And when you do that, you lose control of your own character. It's a very meta moment for the game that we won't see uh, ourselves in the game. You know, uh, all I'll do is just describe it that way. Um, but control again is a motif you saw in the background. Okay, so in this section leading up to this building. We didn't have a lot to do. There weren't any like real obstacles or enemies or anything. Um, and the game communicates a lot environmentally in those sections where you don't have really demanding gameplay by showing you things in the background. Um, here's, here's the camera going down, showing you a little bit more up. There's that safe up there. And we're going to have to interact with that safe to progress through the area. The game is, again, subtly telling us um, what we need to do next without having to say it explicitly. Anyway, in the in the background to this building, as we were approaching, we saw that line of uh, processed humans. Um, they were all perfectly spaced in completely regular uh, spacing, but they were all slouched kind of inhumanly. Um, and something disturbing seems to be going on with these processed humans. Why are they going into this building? Um, they came out of the truck. They seem to have been collected on the truck. Um, and for what purpose, we, we can only speculate right now. So, we saw the safe perched high up because the, um, the game pulled back and showed us information that was up. Um, and so now we have pushed the safe down uh, through that floor. You see that yellow cord on the left-hand side? That's an indicator that an Easter egg is back there. So if I had gone back to pry open that gate, I could have gotten the Easter egg. But again... Any percent run, so we won't be bothering with that. Here's another control helmet puzzle. Um, one aspect of this game, uh, speedrunning a game like this, there's actually no RNG, um, nothing, no random elements in this game. Everything is completely predictable, um, and that is a relief to a speedrunner who's trying to get a best time. That like it's all execution; um, it's not dependent on luck. And so it doesn't quite try your patience in the same way. Um, but because it's a puzzle platformer, um, the most challenging parts of this game are things that you that a speedrun won't really do justice to. You won't see how difficult some of these puzzles are uh, by by in light of the fact that it takes a speed you know a runner or just a player to um, uh, a long time to get through those. Uh, 
puzzles, you know, beating your head against the wall, like, okay, what am I supposed to do here? Um, Speedrunning a game like this uh, totally clarifies what the puzzles are, but um, doesn't really do justice to um, the real challenge that uh, this game is. Um, instead, what the challenge comes from for speedrunning in this game is uh, rote memorization, knowing exact the exact sequence of what you need to do in order to pass a section, um, and not messing up when uh, you are, should know better. Um, there's a lot of just unique sequences in this game um, that you just have to memorize um, by the time that you're ready to speed run it. So here, this is the fastest way that I can get through this barricade is by mashing um, left and right, left and right, left and right. Uh, and that kind of um, mashing is going to come up one more time in the game at a section I'll call the doggy door. Um, it's one of the things where I'll openly admit that I don't have a particularly optimal strategy. There's two, yeah, there's two parts in this game that are just technically demanding, timing demanding, um, and are just hard to do. And just to be on the safe side in this game, uh, this game plan, I'm going to do uh, suboptimal strategies on those two um, sections. So we've kind of heard this marching in the background. And now um, we hear, hear this kind of beating pulse now that we turned on that generator. Um, and uh, this, this you know, low bass beating pulse um, is going to contribute to the rhythm of the marching of these processed humans that have been kind of going on in the background, but we haven't seen up close yet. In a moment, we will see these um, these marching humans up close. You see them walking through the street there. They're all marching towards something in some strange unison. And what do you know? We find ourselves in this line. Um, early review footage of this game. Um, I, I remember like reviews having this, um, this part of the game as part of the um, as part of the review, it's, it's 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 an iconic moment in the game where you're under this intense scrutiny of this closed circuit um, television camera, scrutinizing you, looking at you, making sure that you're doing everything uh, exactly in uniform with everything everyone else. I'll jump the gun a little bit there. It's hard to talk and hear the rhythm. Uh, at the same time, I've screwed this next section up in a run before. It was very embarrassing. I have to remember to jump here. But you see this uh, scrutiny of the of the television camera, and now you see these other people who are not processed humans looking at you um, and ensuring that you are uniform with everyone else. And if you're not, you'll be killed. Um, you'll be taken out of the line. And uh, it's a sad day. Um, this kind of scrutiny is, um, I, you know, I would relate to uh, Michel Foucault's idea of disciplinarity uh, from his work, uh, Discipline and Punish, that this is the state disciplining you as the player and the process humans to ensure conformity, total conformity, and to make sure that the populace is disciplined. Um, and discipline is a means of uh, expressing power in Foucault, but also here. Um, what also totally merits uh, a mention is uh, control. Control as a mechanic in this game, control as a motif, um, that also came up uh, when I mentioned that um, uh, the good ending that we won't see. Um, control is um, something that the state attempts to exercise on you in order to get what it wants out of you and um, additionally to get what it wants out of the populace. So I'll make this dog commit and now that it committed to the low path, I'd take the high one and get away from it. Um, 
control again is this motif that runs through the game um, you have the control helmet that you use but also the state in trying to control information trying to control uh, these processed humans and enacting slavery um, through the processed humans getting you know uh, extracting slave labor out of this process this class of processed humans um, the game is talking very much about control as well as discipline that we saw through the closed circuit uh, television and through um, the uh, the monitoring from these non-processed humans. Um, in gaming essays on algorithmic culture, Alexander Galloway um, talks about uh, both Foucault and Deleuze um, with respect to games that Deleuze puts us in this control society and Galloway argues that games are the uh, the example par excellence of uh, the control society, the medium that best expresses what the control society does. Oh, did I get hit? I got hit. Oh, man, I thought I was through. I knew I'd clip that too soon. What a shame. Just barely, too. What a shame. So, um, in this game, you will see towards the end um, this section where you have all these researchers um, um, studying how to... I mean, these re researchers that have been enabling the state... Um, through all these technologies of biological control. We saw the pig controlled by the worm. We've, we've seen these processed humans that are completely open to control from whoever occupies this control helmet. And uh, you'll see uh, the player control uh, various groups of non-player characters. Um, that um, games are all about this kind of control of information, manipulating uh, bits of information in order to get a desired result. Um, the best example being like a game like SimCity, in which you're converting one resource to another, and the gameplay is managing all of these resources uh, in order to get your desired result. Um, in this game, um, we have the state controlling the character and the state controlling the populace. Um, and the game engages in some very savvy cultural criticism um, through, through that. Um, the concentration of power in those who have the ability to control the populace. Um, there are some really, you know, uh, there's some really uh, great material there. Um, for for the game to uh, have this critical dialogue about control and algorithmic control specifically. Up here you can see that um, there's this train that is sparsely populated with what looks to be non-processed humans. Um, and below you see this train receding into the background of uh, clearly processed humans packed into this never-ending sequence of cars. And um, it's, you know, the game is really evoking a kind of 1% versus 99%, but at the same time, um, this visual reference um, echoes uh, concentration camps, Nazi concentration camps, of uh, people packed into, um, into trains like this, headed to whatever purpose the state deems for them. Um, very disturbing imagery um, on top of some of the you know more regular scares of you know biological weapons and uh, disturbing abominations such as the pig with the worm and others. The game is um, divided up into these uh, sections. We started in the woods and then we went through the farm. Now we're in the city. There will be an underwater section coming up. I always try to grab that chain low because it, it takes so long to descend on this chain. You have to wait until about even with the lamp to get 
off of here safely. I mentioned that there's two difficult parts, technically difficult parts in the game. Um, one is the uh, doggy door that's coming up in a little bit, and the other is um, in the aeroblast chamber. In both of those sections, I'm going to take conservative uh, strategies just to be a little safer. I'm still bummed about that um, that door closing on me while I was falling. I really thought I was going to do a deathless run today, and then I make a dumb mistake like that, I'm trying to shave the door too close for no good reason. You saw the dogs in the background, and then you heard the dog in the background, and now you see that it's coming for you. This puzzle is about getting the dog to commit to the water so that you can get out. You swim, you're a lot better in the in the water than the dogs. Um, and you can get away from it that way, but the dogs catch up to you. So this is the doggy door. It's possible to do this in one cycle. I have never done it. And instead what I'm going to do is just two cycle it. So get the first board, loosen the second, and now bring the dogs back around and get the rest of the second and finally the third. It, it's possible to do it in one, but really hard. Never done it. I've tried like 50 times. That's the end of the city section. This is the start of the uh, underwater section. Up to this point, we've been chased with people with guns. We've been chased by dogs, by possessed pigs. We've been um, threatened with um, these surveillance machines that kill us if we step out of line or do something that we're not supposed to. Um, and in a moment, we're going to climb into that submarine. In all this time spent running from stuff, um, it makes me appreciate the submarine as kind of a respite from the horrors of this game. It's nice to have a moment of feeling somewhat empowered that like, oh, I can move to places that I couldn't before and I'm kind of protected here. I've got this submarine to help me get where I'm going. It's a moment of relief. Um, in a game that's often very disturbing and off-putting. Speaking of disturbing and off-putting, you get into this area, the, mu the music changes, and um, you realize some degree of the enormity of the scope of the state's uh, structure, that um, the state apparently has finances and interest in constructing such a, an elaborate underwater facility um, it's just a mind-boggling um, vastness in this facility um, that um, um, that it, you know it's immediately impressive um, how much how much is underwater here um, and how you know how much the state is is able to do with its resources of slave labor you get out of the sub for the first time you have to open this door up here, but it takes a while to get to get to that door. Um, but, uh, you know, just, just to say a little bit about affect um, in this game, um, that um, being, being in that submarine, feeling a little bit more safe from the, um, the outside world um, enables this, this feeling of, of relief for the player um, that heightens heightens um, the uh, difficulties of, you know, being chased elsewhere. You know, I, you can you can jump um, to the opposite end of a platform and open the opposite side if you jump at the right height. Lost a little time there trying to, trying to shave the jump close. Uh, you may have noticed by now that, like, in, for the most part, I'm jumping around, but when I'm being chased by something, uh, my character enters into a different kind of running animation. I guess we can call it sprint. Um, and when you're being chased, you don't want to jump anymore. It slows you down. So you can just hold the direction of running away from 
the object that you're running away from, and you don't have to jump all the time. I think this is the first instance of these um, boxes with um, kind of this ripcord that makes them float. Um, for the most part, they appear on these like poles. They're kind of tethered to you know one di one dimension. Um, but um, the uh, we'll see examples later where we're kind of freed up with these with these boxes and making them do interesting things. Some of the vines in this game you have to swing multiple times on. Some of them you can just do on the first try, like this one. And uh, pay attention to the foreground as we move here. Some weird blob in the foreground. Oh no. There was something in the water. You thought you were alone. You thought you were totally safe in this submarine, but no, you have company. and You're not entirely sure what you just saw or if you just saw something threatening. We will see more of that, whatever that thing was, um, in a little bit here. And now you've given the player um, reason to doubt their safety. Um, the um, submarine felt so safe before, now we aren't so sure. And this puzzle requires the player to get out of the submarine and push this red button so that you can progress to the next area. Um, you never feel so exposed as you do in, in this moment. Like, I was safe before, now there's something in the water, what's going to get me? And, uh, spoiler, there's nothing in the water. <laughs> um, there's no enemy here, and it doesn't, the game, um, doesn't really give you anything to run away from. But you, it does make you feel totally exposed here, and that enemy that we saw in the foreground a moment ago has not left our consciousness. Um, we are confident that they're going to come back soon. And I just really like this section. Boy in a submarine. So here's that enemy. Has this dissonant synth music while you're running away from it. And you kind of have to shine your light to make sure it doesn't approach you. Because if it does get you, it will crack your window and kill you. And you have to lock it in there um, because this section takes, or, you know, this little this little uh, opening takes two hits. And so you're defenseless for at least one of those hits. And if the drowned girl is in there with you, uh, she will kill you. So that's the end of the submarine. Goodbye, submarine. It was fun. Thanks for your help. What we're coming up on here is the platform puzzle. It's funny, did I lose? Twitch says I've been on for 24 minutes, but I know I've been streaming for at least 30 consecutive min minutes. This section is the longest single puzzle in the game. You see this individual over there. We can't get to them yet. Um, but uh, we're going to be spending, I don't know, close to 10 minutes um, going through this puzzle. It requires a very specific sequence to do it optimally. In the background, we can hear this rhythmic thudding. Boom. Um, and it's kind of a preview of what we're going to see in the next section of the game, the Aeroblast Chamber, which again has the other really challenging part of the run. Um, so it's going to, you know, we're, we're headed there next, but we still have to finish this platform puzzle or more, more accurately do the platform puzzle. When we turned the generator on, there was this platform that had the number 19 on it. And um, you would see if you if you if you directed the player character over there, um, you would see that number go down by one. And what it's saying is that we need to get 19 bodies or 19 more bodies on that platform um, in order to progress to the next section. So this puzzle is about collecting processed humans. As you run through these, you can hear them snoring, which is a strange touch. It's not really explained, like nothing in the game is really explained. 
Um, but the implication seems to be that the state is able to control these process humans um, in kind of a sleep state or something like that. And there's just a lot of, you know, evidence that the state is doing whatever it feels like with human lives and, I mean, with animal lives too. Um, here's, here's an example of a vine that you really can't do on the first swing. Even though that one looks like you totally can. You gotta do an extra swing. I've tried. Um, and so, um, we saw before that there was this control helmet kind of above all these processed humans. So, try to get into it. But it snaps off. And what was once a tether technology now becomes this um, mobile technology. It's wearable. And you can take control uh, with you in order to uh, control these processed humans and move them towards the platform. This would be a good time to talk about the figure of the cyborg, which comes up in a, a few different ways in this game. Um, and uh, the critical work that I point to is um, Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto, in which Haraway talks about cyborg as a, a, a mode of identification that transcends uh, taxonomic categories of identification. Um, the cyborg bridges distinctions between person and machine, um, human and human, human and animal, and uh, physical and non-physical. Um, and is therefore a useful concept to anyone um, anyone who uh, is concerned with uh, transgressive modes of identification. Um, that um, being cyborg is um, is is a is a means of uh, or a way to be transgressive of identity and not to fit into one particular category um you're not male female you're not black white asian uh or uh or otherwise um you're not uh straight or queer you're not um rich poor you are um cyborg you are transgressive of all of these and the cyborg identity is um um transcendent of um, all, all, you know, all, all kinds of identification and is therefore useful to a radical politics. In this game, we'll see different um, examples in um, embodiments of cyborg technology, the first being this helmet, but we will see later kind of implanted technology that makes the player character even more clearly post-human. Um, that the player player character gains these um, superhuman abilities through the technology, through these uh, odd fusions, and is open to monstrous fusions. Even again, uh, this kind of this kind of fusion is uh, transgressive of strict identi uh, identificatory categories. So we've done the bottom section of this puzzle. We'll go all the way to the top before we go to the middle, and that's where the puzzle will you know, finally end. Um, we're collecting all these processed humans in order to make that number go down from 19 to 0, and once it does, we can get through um, the door to the next section. It's another just immense space that the state has ostensibly created for unknown reasons. We can see in the interior here that there's kind of this gauge and this machine in the background and we can kind of see the dust rising with every with every um, rhythmic thud. Gives us some clearer preview of what's to come in the next, plat uh, in the next uh, section that there's some kind of rhythmic pressure event something that something that's making all this dust move. 
that was um, we dragged this ostens- you know ostensibly deceased process human out onto the platform, and it looks like we would raise the cage here, but instead we're pushing the cage off to destroy it. Um, in that move, we're not trying to look after the well-being of the processed humans inside. We're just using them for their bodies. Um, and the player is kind of forced to use those processed humans for their bodies. Um, and in that regard, um, the player is no better than the state in its um, in its use, uh, its de- dehumanizing use of proce- the bodies of processed humans. That we're just we're just exploiting these humans for their labor and. Um, for whatever we need out of them. Um, and that's exactly what the state is doing. So a um, a critical, you know, that, that would be a critical approach to describing what the player has to do in this section. The more um, charitable description would be to say, like, okay, we're, we're, we're really using the tools of the state against it. We're, we're destroying the master's house by using the master's tools. I have screwed that up before, so glad it made it. And even if we have to break a few eggs, mistreat human bodies um, in the process, it, we're totally justified because we have to destroy the state um, that has made this abominable set of circumstances like processed humans, control, uh, uh, technological slavery, etc. Speaking of bodies, um, you'll notice by now that everyone that's following you is uh, male-bodied. Um, they all seem to have the same um, body type. Um, they have overalls and or um, uh, um, tank tops, hard hats. They seem to be kind of a stereotypical uh, construction worker kind of body. And again, are all males. And uh, furthermore, every single character in this game is white. Um, there's kind of a you know a very traditional kind of um, uh, construction of identity that's going on in this game that uh, you know is pretty consistent with games generally focus on uh, male protagonist, male agency, um, and uh, hegemonically uh, male uh, NPCs in this game. This is um, the Aeroblast Chamber, and um, we don't really... Uh, I'm going to do a really conservative strat here. I'm going to wait. And I'm going to go, you know, along with this mechanism. I can't catch up to it now. I can't get over to that other section and be shielded. So I'm just going to wait here and let it cycle through. In every run that I've done up to this point, I've died on this section. So rather than die again, I will uh, let it cycle through an additional time. It pains me. It pains me not to do the optimal strat, which is really cool to see and really gratifying to get. But I've accepted that uh, it's it's just too tricky. Uh, to try to do for me. I'll come back to the topic of uh, of gender and representation and whiteness in this game. That, um, you know, the game has so much to say about technological slavery and uh, class relations and um, state power that um, unfortunately does not offer anything to discussions of intersectionality in this game when all the characters are white. It's a missed opportunity in this game to uh, more, more critically consider uh, race in constructions of socioeconomic status. Um, I mean, I acknowledge that this is, a, um, this is what a Scandinavian developer and you know, their cultural frame of reference is theirs, but um, it really misses an opportunity to uh, 
be more critical of race by literally, you know, whitewashing the entire cast of characters. And it, again, it's in line with uh, con- conventions in the game, uh, in, in games generally, that, okay, well, here's another white male protagonist. Like, imagine that. Um, and, uh, you know, all of the construction workers that we saw were male. And we'll see in a research facility coming up that nearly all of the people in lab coats are male. Um, and just, you know, the game has a pretty restrictive kind of um, embodiment when it comes to uh, uh, race and gender. We're now at the uh, underwater research facility here. Those These two lips that you kind of uh, climb over, they're the only two in the game that it, it, you take a little bit slower to get through um, to convey, like, you know, how short of breath your character must be. have to open this door wide enough that it doesn't close before you get to it. That was close. <laughs> and we're going to see some more of these um, drowned girls in a second here. Spoiler. Oh wait, yeah, before we do that, we have another set of these um, ripcord boxes. Another example of like, you have to be very uh, deliberate about your sequencing. I messed that up yesterday where I didn't extend the platform at the right time and trap the box where it wasn't supposed to be. Again, the challenge of speedrunning this game is making sure that you get the sequence right 100% um, the first time. Because there's a lot of similar sequences, but you can't get them confused. So here's the Drown Girl. You can recognize the dissonant soundtrack. And now she's coming for you. And this is definitely the freakiest part to me. The This section still freaks me out. Uh, especially in the next uh, set of puzzles. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's just, you know, instinctual fears of drowning and uh, just this this crushing inevitability of, like, she's coming for you, she's going to get you. Um, to say a little bit about affect, like, you know, a horror game, and, and so, I mean, we can call this a puzzle platformer, but it has a strong horror element that... Um, it is trying to scare you um, in terms of, you know, the jump scare from the pig, this kind of enemy that is disturbing and has, you know, this dissonant um, uh, audio cue. Um, and then the just the subject matter of, uh, okay, well, imagine that um, this, you know, the state power is trying to deprive you of your agency, make you into a zombie to labor for them. Um, you know, it's disturbing stuff. Biological experimentation, that's weird stuff. There's such a there's such a thing in this game, in the speed run, as a um, chain skip, where you um, are able to bypass that whole chain moving left and right. Um, and um, you can do it if you're really fast. I am not really fast, so I do the more conservative strat through it. I'm using a um, keyboard and mouse, or, I mean, really just a keyboard. Um, I think uh, the world record holder, Light Drew, um, I believe he uses an Xbox One, and so he has joysticks uh, to do the run, and so you can do um, a better job of things like that section to get the, the chain skip when you have a joystick and are able to choose your angles. Really, I because I'm using WASD, um, I can only choose like eight different angles, the cardinal directions in their immediate, I- intermediaries. This is the other, like, I don't know, it's like the last really spooky part to me. Um, just because getting dragged to your death is just really effective. That's really effective horror. Feel like that drowned girl is going to get you every time. 
and you again you so this this is kind of this heat seeking AI. You have to draw the drowned girl out to you so that she doesn't have enough time to you know, she's too far away from you when you enter here to get you and um and pull you to your death. Alright, so that's the last drowned girl puzzle. And coming up is the um, longest cinematic in the, in the game. I'll take a drink. I've been talking for a while. You see that this drowned girl um, is dragging you down to your death. Um, there's nothing you can do about it. You might think at first, like, oh, I screwed something up and now I'm dying. But the camera stays on you and it doesn't say, like, continue or anything like that. And uh, as you lose lose your breath... You, you drown, and then her movements become much more gentle. She's gliding you down towards the bottom. Instead of dragging you. And it just kind of keeps going. Um, you see this yellow cord, and then it becomes attached to you, and then the drowned girl leaves. So the implication, it, it doesn't really show this very clearly, but the implication is that this was the drowned girl's intent. She's going to attach this to you, and it's going to follow you most of the way down. It's the same color yellow as the control helmet, and um, what was a stationary technology, you know, tethered to a cord, then became a wearable technology when we had the control, control helmet on our character, and now it becomes this embedded technology that is now part of the player character. And spoiler, we get to move again once we hit the, the bottom of this body of water. Um, this is not game over. Um, we uh, gain the ability to swim indefinitely underwater at, at this section. And, um, you know, this would be another example of becoming post-human, that um, the cybernetic... Um, technology that has been embedded in the player character um, it's now uh, part of them and makes them more than what they what they were before continuing with the motif of um, fish friends or animal friends we saw the chicks before those yellow puffy chicks now we have the fish friends following you around I don't know there's something comforting to me about these fish friends they keep you company and the world seems like it's against you following you around. They're just chill. They just want to hang out. I enjoy them. This section um, is another one of those ones where there's no like puzzles to get through. Um, instead, you're kind of contemplating the world that you find yourself in. Um, the game doesn't really explain what's going on here, but there's this vast underwater facility um, looks like it was probably once occupied by people on feet, but uh, is now completely submerged, and who knows what it was for. And it gives you time to consider the enormity of this complex and all the water. Like, why is water involved in this? Why was this constructed? Body parts kind of flow through this vent multiple times actually we have to hold on here so as not to get chopped up by the propellers and then we see more body parts fly through okay, just getting churned up in the propellers yet another example of the desecration of human bodies as a result of whatever the state's agenda is How are we doing on time? 51 minutes. In uh, one strange interaction is that in waist high water, instead of just holding to the right or jumping to the right, you briefly go to the left and then you speed up to the right. 
kind of an odd mechanical circumstance um, that I can't really explain. I just know that it's faster. Here's another one of those surveillance puzzles where you have to hide yourself, make sure you don't get caught, and now move this mechanism. It's one of the last really lethal parts of the game. If I screw this up, but I think they did that okay. Yeah, it should be fine. Easy. Okay, good. I have screwed that up before. The uh, camera goes up to show you something down in Assassin's Creed-like. You leap from a tall height into a safe uh, receptacle. We're going to have to come back through the bottom of that in a little bit. But the camera now comes down to show you something up. There's water on the ceiling, bodies floating upside down in this water. Um, another weird technology that the state controls. Um, I used to do that puzzle all wrong. I'd go and um, move the box and uh, pull the cord and then try to hit the box as it was coming up. But no, you don't have to do that. You can actually just hit it on the way down. This is a little save that saves a tiny bit of time if done properly. Let's see if I can get it this time. That was close, but not not correct. You can get the box to go through the opening and land safely on the other side. It saves a couple seconds. It's no big deal. But it'd be nice to get it. So this is the uh, research facility. There's one more section after this game. After this section, it's um, the observatory with the game's sublime ending. We're through most of the um, life-threatening parts of the game. We have maybe uh, 20 or so minutes left. This is one of those sections, or one of those puzzles where you have to be very deliberate about your sequencing, because you can easily screw this up. You have to do the bottom one, the top one, then jump on top of the top one. And you can get in here to the upside down water. And thank goodness you have the swimming ability, because now you can destroy the machinery. And no one can really mess with you. But I mean, it's just so creepy that all these bodies are floating upside down. You never get answers to what this, what is actually going on here. Let's see if I can get the opposite side. No, I can't. I really wanted to show that one off. Yeah. See, you jump off and then you get you kind of magnet back to the right-hand side. If you do it really well, you jump off and you open the door from the left-hand side, impossibly, like clinging to a ladder that doesn't exist, and open it there. It's very strange. Hello, my my righty, my right eye occasionally. Thanks for popping in. I'm doing an analytical speed run of uh, inside right now. So this um, this um, moment here where you see in the background um, uh, that little, you know, the kid in the red hat, uh, I don't know, it's, it's gripping to me that um, here's, you know, the game is displaying, um, you know, this figure that should be innocent, this child um, in a little red hat, um, but you know by seeing it that this child is being indoctrinated into the state that um, the child is um, being shown this kind of technological slavery as, yet, as if it's normal. Um, that the state isn't solely these uh, 
sociopathic adults, um, but is also comprised of their children. You uh, drop the audio here because you're on the opposite side of what seems to be so soundproof glass. I like this section. This is a fun puzzle. And um, because you're on the opposite side of, of soundproof glass, you look as if you are um, under scrutiny. You're a test subject. This is another puzzle. Ooh. This is another puzzle with very deliberate sequencing. I shaved that a little too close. I didn't have to bring the water level down that low. Um, but, um, you know, you have to get the box up there, and then you have to get the water level just right so that you can jump into the water, but not um, trigger the door. I briefly triggered the door there and lost a little time. There's two agents of the state down there. If you swim through the barrier, then they'll shoot you. And it's one of the last places where, you know, the game is totally lethal if you mess up. After this, the only way to really die is, like, if you fall from a great height. You raise the water level, and then these mutilated bodies fall disturbingly onto these boxes head first. It's disgusting. And then bizarrely they get up to help you. The bodies become unrecognizable at this point. Um, what seems to be evidence of forced amputations, uh, weird experiments, um, just de dehumanizing practices of the state to um, manipulate bodies however it wants and to use them for whatever kind of labor uh, it happens to be doing. There's some reason it would appear that the state is putting these bodies in, um, sus you know, suspending them in water and using them for energy, using them as a thought network, who knows exactly uh, what their use is to the state, but clearly they are being uh, exploited as something, as some kind of resource. And, you know, this explains why the state is continuing to collect bodies and why the state was um, pursuing you at the start of the game. Here you have to take a page from the state and um, use bodies uh, to, su to suit your purposes. Um, to kind of sacrifice them, make them jump from a great height so that they will break your fall and you won't die. Another example of um, the player having to resort to strategies that don't really put them on a moral high ground compared to the state. The player is forced to use the same kind of dehumanizing practices that the state does. Kind of make them jump off like lemmings. And then we want to get about three of them into this elevator. If we can get three, then that's all we really need. We don't need to collect all of them. Because that's all you need to um, open this door coming up. Once we open this door, we'll be in the observatory section. Music changes, signaling a shift in section. And we've spent our whole time in this game being, you know, running from something, running from dogs, running from agents in masks. Now we see others running to this structure, um, one last big structure in the state's, um, uh, in, the, in the state's architecture, um, that everyone seems to be running to something and uh, running to the right, like you are. Um, in a moment, we're going to see another person running in the foreground. And, you know, by experience, we're going to think, oh, they're chasing us. It's time to time to run away. But in fact, they are not interested in us. They're running like the others in the background towards some object to our right. Some happening is going on over there that we don't, not, that we don't quite know yet. 
So here's that person in the foreground. They trip on these chairs. You think, oh, he's totally coming for me. No, not at all. Another, uh, you know, a, a golf cart comes by in the background. Another two people there. Not interested in you. You can see these um, professionals in white clothing here. Again, most of them are male. Just bears pointing out. And uh, if you went all the way to the right there to that tank, you'd be next to all those other people, but you wouldn't actually see what they see. You have to keep going. And here you can see from the top of the tank, people looking in, but you don't, don't know what they're looking at. You can't see for yourself yet. And to return to the topic of you know empathy, what, what makes us empathize with the player characters, their defenselessness, their powerlessness, their um, inability to do anything but run from the state. Um, here uh, you see a, a bunch of yellow cords. This is where you would go to enable the secret ending that we won't see today because we didn't do any of the Easter eggs. And in my opinion, the, the regular, the bad ending is more fun. And uh, having spent all this time running, the player may wonder, like, what am I supposed to do about the state? What can I do? I've been powerless this whole time. And the player has, you know, empathized with the powerlessness of the player character, but hasn't been able to do anything back to the state or to the agents of the state in return. We're going to do what, I, what we do best here. Let's wreck, wreck this structure. Take it apart in order to progress to the next area. Turn the power back on. And that will give us enough time to get to the bottom before the machine is quite at full rotation. Got to grab this, and once we grab that, a way opens up. The clothes come off inexplicably. And now we see what everyone was looking at. This disgusting ball of humans fused or sutured together. And what can you do but free it? There's these four control helmet looking things on it. Ostensibly making this ball labor for the state. But you've freed it. You've become attached to the ball, and now you're controlling the ball. And you've spent your whole time running from the state and its agents. And now you're able to turn the table, break open the cage, and cause people to run in fear from you. It's this disgusting but incredibly gratifying ending to the game. It, you know, you don't see it coming. You've been defenseless this whole time, and now you're the wrath of the 99%. All these people who have been processed and exploited now form a quite literal collective. And through collective action, you just mess stuff up. You destroy the door, you crash through every window, you crash through the floor, through the equipment, you cause people to run screaming in terror away from you. It's it's gratifying, but in this monstrous, disgusting way that you have, you know, transcended this individual identification and now identify as the collective. Now you are together with all these other humans who have been processed by this wicked state. And now you turn your wrath towards them. You're able to enlist the help of those uh, other processed humans who aren't part of the ball they help you up here and you don't have anything in particular that you're directing your rage at you're just crashing through everything and it doesn't really matter what these other people are all you know is that they're part of the state part of this awful um, assemblage of power and you have to destroy anything in order to break free. Come on.
Kisten. It's so fun to be this monster that's destroying everything. You see these white collar workers in their cafeteria gawking at you, running away from you. And you get to this office with a title on the outside and there's a man at the desk and you don't know what their title is. You don't know if they're the top person in the office, but you will pile drive them and destroy them. You can read that character as the man upstairs, the head boss, whatever you want, and say like, oh, that's the executive of the state. That's who's ultimately in in power here. Um, that would make sense. You can't, I mean, there's no way to say for sure. Um, it's a very sensible interpretation. And if you do read it, as that figure, then it's all the more gratifying to destroy them by crushing them. The dogs are totally ineffectual against you. Once what once terrified or terrorized the uh, player character, now it's nothing. You trample over them. And what we had before were confederates in processed humans who were like helping us up. Uh, to that lip. Now we have a confederate who's clearly not moving like a processed human, but is sympathetic to your desire to break free and suggests that there was disagreement within the... He was just the cafeteria manager? I don't think so. I think that was an executive, but you can you can interpret it how you want. Um, so the... Um, why would you have a desk job for the cafeteria method? No. Why would you, that doesn't need a desk job. Anyway. Uh, so you have this um, collective just rampaging through. Um, and, um, and all you have to, you know, all you can think about is breaking free and, uh, you know, burning stuff and moving past so you rip up this furnace to ignite the box and uh oh yeah what i was saying before was um the confederates here um this collective needs help from the inside in order to break free that confederates aligned with the state um are open doors for you and they are some of your most uh, important um, allies. So you destroy this gas line here. It enables you to progress forward. You see these people gawking at you from the background. And up, up ahead we'll have another confederate who will um, uh, who will help you open the way forward and help you break through this wall? But just to return to an earlier point of the uh, cyborg manifesto Haraway's essay, what we see here is this radical. Um, radical refusal of discrete identificatory um, characteristics that you are now fused with the collective, that you escape categorization, that you as an individual are uh, post-human and beyond male, female, etc. That you are fused with this broader collective that lacks any such easy identification. Here you have a confederate who's going to open this um, record box for you to get through. And this is the state's last attempt at trapping you. Last attempt, uh, last attempt at controlling you by making you stand in this spot and then opening the door out, out from under you. But 
they of course don't continue. And there's always an escape. The fish friends return. They were following you before, but now they show you where you're supposed to go next. One last romp with your fish friends. I don't know, I have a I have affection for these <laughs> weird fish. And uh, we just have one puzzle left in the game, so I'm on minute 73 now. Hopefully I'll break 74. And, um, you know, if you were expecting a large, elaborate, tricky puzzle to complete the game with, uh, you may be disappointed because all you have to do is run to the right and run to the right one more time. Maybe a little disappointing, but that's the end. So 73 minutes and 22 seconds. It's actually a best time, happy with that. And in this, uh, in this ending, you kind of roll out into the wilderness, into this inexplicably pastoral scene, this patch of sunny, sunny grass by a lake. Um, that you certainly would have never seen coming after all the horrors of the technologically enabled state to end on this uh, non sequitur of a, of a pastoral ending. Um, you may read this as kind of a limitation of like, you know, where the developers could see the collectivism of the ending going. Like, what is the final col conclusion of these, uh, of this rampaging collective? We don't know. Um, what what is the outcome of this monstrous fusion that transcends um, discrete identity? We don't know, um, but um, it it has escaped. It's gotten out of the out of the state, and you can rest now. And then the credits roll. Uh, I want to give some shout outs to uh, people who made this project uh, happen: um, Mark Deppy and Kathy Chang in the. Um, uh, in the UCI esports arena have been super helpful and everyone uh, on the stream team here has been super helpful in uh, making my research uh, happen um, and giving me giving me a platform to do fun projects like this. Um, I want to thank uh, my advisor Braxton Soderman for uh, his support for all of my uh, scholastic endeavors and I want to thank my uh, my partner Emily and uh, our daughter Autumn uh, for their patience with uh, my my research and uh, their uh, constant support. So thank you so much for watching. This has been an analytical speed run. My name is Matt Knudsen. I'm a graduate student at uh, the Univers University of California at Irvine. I did this project um, as uh, as a personal challenge, but also as as a fun uh, way to engage scholarship more publicly. Uh, thank you so much for watching.